Good morning and welcome to the 17th meeting of the Health and Sport Committee for 2018. Can I ask everyone in the room to please ensure mobile phones are off or on silent and please do not record or film the proceedings. Uh, the first item on our agenda is an evidence session on pre-budget scrutiny for the Scottish Government budget for financial year 2019-20. This is an area where the Health and Sport Committee has set a bit of a pace in terms of pre-budget scrutiny uh, and we're keen uh, to ensure that we continue to set that positive pace. So we are uh, taking an early look at the budget for the forthcoming financial year. Uh, we have received apologies this morning from Miles Briggs. Uh, can I welcome to the committee representatives of five health and social care partnerships across Scotland. Uh, Judith Proctor, the Chief Officer of Edinburgh, Eddie Fraser, the Director of Health and Social Care at East Ayrshire, Pam Gowans, the Chief Officer at Murray, uh, Janice Hewitt, the Chief Accountable Officer at North Lanarkshire, and Robert McCulloch Graham, the Chief Officer uh, at Scottish Borders. Uh, welcome to you all, and I look forward to hearing from you. We have, as a committee, uh, been keen to ensure that uh, we had sight of, and, and that others had sight of, uh, uh, full financial information regarding integration authorities as well as health boards and uh, we were therefore uh, pleased, I think I, I can fairly say, when the Scottish Government made that information available uh, earlier this month in the form of a consulted report on integration authority finances. And I wonder if we could start perhaps by asking each of the authorities uh, here today uh, how that uh, publication, how helpful that will be for you in, in your work and whether you will use it in benchmarking in comparison with other integration authorities. Who would like to start? I'm happy to, Please to do. start. So I think it's really helpful uh, to be able to see it. Um, I think it's also important that we understand what the fair comparisons are. Um, so because different partnerships have different services within them, then you will see, you know, different. So some partnerships have children's services, some partnerships have justice. So it can't just be a straight read across. You need to be actually look at a family, you know, of partner services that are actually like for, for like. That being said, you know, you do see trends in them. I mean, you see trends in them, it's really good, you know, rather than just look at what's happening in Ayrshire, to be able to see what's happening right across the country and other similar types of board areas, like maybe Tayside or Grampian, where there's several partnerships within, you know, that one board area. So I think seeing that and seeing that on a regular basis for us is a really helpful tool in our financial planning. Thank you very much. Probably just to add, yes, I think that it's what lies beneath and, and understanding the, the detail around this and allowing us to um, ask more questions because it has stimulated uh, more questions to be considered. So I think it'll be very useful. A great deal of learning to be had across the 32 partnerships themselves. So any information that's shared is always going to be useful. Uh, but to get some benchmarking between us is essential, really, when we're coming into each of the budget rounds. Sure, sure. Excellent. And um, I think that seems to be a, a shared view across the board, and, and that's very helpful to understand. Clearly, one of the things that's become clear uh, from that consolidated financial information is that there are uh, issues of overspend in the current financial year in a number of partnerships. And can I ask uh, those partnerships who have that situation uh, what your plans are for addressing that overspend in the course of this financial year? We would be one of the partnerships that indicated that we were heading for an, an overspend. Yep. And again, there are very specific you know, reasons and areas where the overspend um, is. So our overspend uh, in terms of what we consider the health part of the budget would be almost totally uh, primary care prescribing. And in terms of the local authority part of the budget, it's out with placements for our children's services. So our if I want to call it our big mainstream services, actually all operate within budget. It's actually some of our services that are very, you know, specific to us that are actually overspent in terms of that. In terms of each of these, you know, we work very closely to actually work out how their change programmes are going to address that. So I work very closely with the Director of Pharmacy and we're also looking at the new input of resources through the primary care. Our new pharmacies get into GP practices or how that can change some of our prescribing you know, patterns and actually reduce that spend of that. 
Some of the increases this year have not been, it's not been about volume of prescribing, it's been unit cost of prescribing going up. So it's a bit difficult, it's slightly out with our control, but at the same time we need to take control eh, of that. And our children's services, it's about the wider well-being of children. So, you know, in terms of the services that we deliver to children, you know, we've recently had our joint children's services inspection and that's been evaluated very positively in terms of the services we provide. So when the children come to us in the partnership, they need these services. Our work has to be around well-being further upstream to make sure we give different support to families, different support to communities, so not as, enough, as many children actually need these services that we, we deliver. So we have very clear, you know, programmes of planning. And indeed, just yesterday, we took a strategic plan associated with a financial plan, a workforce plan, and a property and asset management strategy to the NHS board to share with them, having already been to the council and the integration joint board. So we know where we're going in the future. We know the very specific areas where there are overspend, and we seek to address them. Thank you very much. Uh, to go on one of those areas as well. Um, we've got a significant gap still to find, you'll see from uh, the submission that we've put forward. Um, and that uh, we are addressing, uh, some of those big, bigger pressures are, are really the same as Eddie has just uh, referred to, but there are some broader themes that are kind of historical. So community hospitals have traditionally had a legacy of uh, the, what, it, what we require to uh, budget for in order to run them at the, the Pace, the, the, the level they're at at the moment doesn't match the actual budgets that historically have been ag against them. So there's some legacy um, issues there that we're, we're trying to deal with. But certainly out of area placements, high care packages and prescribing are, are account for the, 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 some of the biggest areas. We have identified um, just over a million um, in actual savings that we are absolutely confident we can make. We ha Looks like our year-end uh, sign-off is going to be better than we thought to the tune of 750,000, but that still leaves about a three and a half million uh, gap to find. The budget in Murray, the size of Murray, it's, it's a small budget. Um, it doesn't take much shift to, for us to be in difficulty. So we're very mindful that the decisions that we take now could be legacy. So we need to do that in a, a very considered way. We have already uh, decommissioned some respite facilities, which was very difficult for the few individuals that were using those respite facilities. But in terms of best value, and our ability to deliver on that with the kind of change in modernisation that's going on through self-directed support that people are choosing not to use those traditional ways of get, seeking respite but we've had to manage the small number of people left uh, quite sensitively but those were in some ways difficult for those involved on a quality and family perspective but easy from a financial perspective because they didn't make good uh, uh, viable business best value sense. Um, we have a, a, a huge number of activities going on just now where we are drilling down with our senior management team into all the services to understand the implications of the gap we have now and indeed the potential gap we might have next year, particularly in relation to the Council's um, difficulties with, it, with, with its budget. So what does that mean uh, for the people of Murray if we are to uh, have to reduce even further the, and reprioritise what, what we do? And so we're looking to do those, make those decisions with people, with the public, and also with uh, both the partner agencies that, that fund us so that we don't have legacy unintended consequences. So by June, we're looking to have a reasonable handle on that, but this will be ongoing work throughout this year because this is a three to five year uh, change programme. I think on a positive note, one of the other aspects that we're looking at, obviously Dr Grays is one of our, our key district general in Murray and is a, mm -hmm. it accounts for most of our unscheduled care. And so we are looking at, with NHS Grampian, how we can bolster and support with some capacity around planning that whole system. Um, because, again, we want to try and make sensible decisions. We've got real recruitment issues, um, rural aspects to uh, both the, the, the GP contract and the, um, the way that we are running the hospital. So there is an opportunity to try and look at that more in a more broad system, systemic sense and hopefully get something that's um, reasonable and palatable and doesn't compromise quality. So that, that, that's what we're trying to do just now. Thank you very much. Judith Proctor, do you have anything to add in relation to Edinburgh? 
in, in regard to, I mean, I've, I've been in post for, this is my fourth week, so haven't been very, very involved in terms of the budget setting up to date in, in Edinburgh. However, I would absolutely echo some of the challenges that are, are, are apparent here. They reflect uh, very similarly uh, those that experienced in Aberdeen and, and, and those reflected by my colleagues. Some of the challenging aspects of the budget, those that it's harder to control um, around about prescribing in particular. So in terms of our savings plans um, for, for this year, year, a lot of focus on prescribing, a lot of focus on, on the opportunities within the primary care improvement plans and new primary care uh, contracts uh, in terms of supporting that as an area. But of course, it becomes increasingly difficult to make some of those savings in prescribing in relation to prescribing practice uh, and custom when some of the challenges relate to external factors around that. I think one of the issues that, um, again, um, quite familiar with from my previous role that can drive some of the challenges in Edinburgh is the particular characteristics of the job market in Edinburgh um, and the makeup of the care home market where we have a high level of private care homes and a challenge in relation to the capacity of care homes that uh, charge us the, the, um, the national care home rate. Um, in order to address some of our well-known challenges around delayed discharge and access to, to good services, um, we need to increasingly look to the, the private and more costly market to try and secure, uh, and that's an ongoing challenge for us and one that we definitely need to look at in terms of how we balance our whole uh, offering across Edinburgh. Uh, particular challenges in uh, the borders are about the rurality of the of the the area, and it is difficult to appoint staff there as well. So we have particular challenges around the number of uh, care beds, residential beds we, that we have, uh, and we have the same problems as, as others of having to use some of the private providers, which are significantly more expensive than others. Uh, the bed model that we have within the residential sector at the moment is is at saturation, and so we need to be uh, creating more uh, beds in that particular area, particularly to deal with uh, delayed discharges to make sure that there is patient flow within there, particular difficulties that we have at the present time. Looking at the savings that the borders have made since the inception of the IGB, there's 6.5 million that's been saved. Uh, on a permanent basis within the partnership, so that's good news. However, the last couple of years there's been uh, saving targets that have been met, but they've been met on a non-recurring basis, which means it's been carried over into the next year. So this financial year, the borders are facing a, 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 a very difficult savings target of just short of 10 million from a budget of 168. So it's going to be a very, very difficult year for us uh, in doing that. Um, the inception of the IGB is to make uh, better use of our community asset and it's the only way we're actually going to make any headway in this. Uh, we need to be able to manage the demand on our services uh, and to do that we need to get access to more of that community asset so be working with the communities in a much better and more efficient way than we have done in the past so that we can effectively do that shift from acute into community care. So all of our um, Strategies and actions are around that, and that's the base of how we're actually moving into the future. But it's a significantly challenging year uh, that we're facing in the borders. Okay, thank you very much. And Diana Stewart. Um, thank you. We are in a very fortunate partnership who have an underspend. Um, and I have to say that prescribing is one of the things, like other colleagues, that, that is overspent. But We've, got, we've created quite a rigorous process around scrutiny of budgets. We have some workforce challenges, so we have vacancies, uh, particularly in areas, uh, as you know, we sit between the Glasgow and Edinburgh corridor, so sometimes that works for us and sometimes it works against us, uh, particularly on, on particular aspects of mental health and uh, some of our mental health uh, workforce. It would be great if we could recruit more to, to that. However, um, in in light of the underspends, we've been uh, fairly creative around some of the models. Uh, this year, we've taken a new home support model through, and as colleagues have said, this is about managing demand in a different way. So trying to get more with the same amount of money, and we've been quite creative around the use of technology. 
and taking demand out the system and equally we see a huge opportunity for technology and I think that's an area that's completely untapped and we would welcome any support in and around there. I think colleagues have mentioned custom practice behaviours and the expectation of service and I think we need to try and uh, manage that uh, over time but certainly our home support service is definitely now in a place where um, we're able to access resource where people need it. We used to have quite rigid uh, workforce patterns and certainly work with our trade union staff side colleagues. We've been trying to change those uh, views on when workers would work. Uh, we've got quite traditional ways of working around uh, Monday to Friday, nine to five, and, and we realise that health and social care is now uh, 24 seven and we need to get appropriate services there. So. Uh, we, we've taken quite a bit of time out to uh, seriously try and change resource, but that, that's not been particularly easy around the things that f may seem sensible um, are not always politically palatable. So we've had to really work hard uh, about evidence, about uh, the, the, the opportunities for change. So certainly from our perspective, uh, those have been fairly managed underspends, and to date we're trying to create some of that transformation money so that we can uh, uh, change the balance of care into the community. One final thing for, for myself on um, the development of the Monklands uh, redevelopment, we are spending quite a bit of time uh, as we design a new acute uh, facility what is required in the community and certainly from our perspective health and social care has been very well respected about if you are going to have a, an effective acute service the whole system needs to come together and I certainly think that some of that transformational money needs to be invested in health and social care and I have to say as well as other colleagues our independent and third sector are key to, to all of this so from us we've got a very good relationship with the third sector interface and that capacity also needs to come from the year as well. Thank you very much. Alison Johnson. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, I'd just like to ask, I'm going to focus first of all on some of the evidence we've, we've received from um, the Edinburgh submission. Um, I think last year it's fair to say that the committee previously heard about difficulties with the budget setting process, um, partly due to different timescales for NHS and local authority budget processes. Um, the fact that local authorities need to present balanced budgets and, uh, and others don't. But Edinburgh has said um, in your submission, the key challenge in agreeing budgets is the prevailing financial environment facing the public sector and the consequent requirement for a high level of savings in services which face significant growth and demographic-led demand. I mean, your submission suggests that communication is good, um, uh, that the process itself hasn't been too difficult, but you feel that the major challenge is actually one of a lack of cash, perhaps? Um, it, it certainly hasn't been difficult for me, the budget setting this year, because I haven't really been involved in it. So um, that, that aside, though, I think the, the, it is important to know that relationships work well, because I, I, I do think that with all the, the, the guidance and the legislation that we have in place that, that drives us to work in a certain way, that's, that's necessary. But um, more important to that, I think, is the relationships and the willingness for, for integration to work and the budget setting process to, to go forward in a, um, in a positive, um, proactive way. And I understand that's what's happened over previous months in Edinburgh and it continues to do so. However, I think one of the things that is very challenging is the, the wider um, interface with um, NHS and the savings that they're required to make and within the local authority and the savings that they're required to make. And it does involve us as chief officers and our IJBs in a, a very detailed round of conversations and priority setting in terms of what we're required to do for our IJB to ensure the best settlement possible, but also to ensure that we work in good partnership with our colleagues and partners in the NHS and the local authority uh, to help achieve the, the savings required there and the outcomes that they're both trying to achieve as well. So I think against a, a generally shrinking financial envelope across Scotland, it involves us all in quite challenging discussions. Okay, um, I'd be grateful if, if others could you know, share your experience about this 
you know, is it your opinion that that lack of lack of finance is as big an issue here as different time skills? But I'd also like to hear your views on, you know, do you think that IGB voice is loud enough? Um, are you perhaps being too polite, too restrained? Um, do you think you're waiting for others to set budgets where you could perhaps be making more of a strident call for what you actually need? Uh, yeah, I, <clears throat> I think there, there's potentially um, something in that. Um, I, I think the, we're, we're still maturing. You know, we've, most, we've really just been in three or two years or three years in, in operations, so we're still, uh, you know, finding our feet against to, um, you know, sitting alongside two organisations that have been around for a long, long time. Um, and but but we've tried. I suppose many of us, and I, I know my colleagues well, um, have strived to maintain relationships to try and resolve this together because there's a finite balance between. Um, being diverted onto a fight as opposed to getting the right outcomes for people and and but but there is also something about are we asserting the authority and the power that we've got at the level that we could and i think there's something about when you are moving forward you need to be moving forward confidently in a certain power and i, I guess i'll link back to what i said before there's something about understanding what it is you're trying to assert so that you don't have unintended consequences that are that are legacy you know for the for the system so i, I think we are becoming more assertive i think it's it's a journey and I I think we have to had to take time to 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 get our feet kind of into a firm position. However, I still think relationships are key to success, and therefore we we will always have to balance that. Any Fraser? Um, I think it's fair to say in East Ayrshire the IGIB is heard quite loud and clear. Um, we sit fully at the community planning table, our relationships with NHS board and with the council uh, in a three-way basis is open and honest. We have real discussions about, you know, if we can actually, you know, suit money into social work and health services. If that means that we don't have money out there in housing or education or some of our health improvement services, then all we do is continue to professionalise our services. Our partnership work with the third sector and the independent sector is really strong, so different from Rob. I mean, we're reducing the number of you know people in, in care home beds. We think a big part of that is the partnership work we do with acute. So we bring people out very early at a hospital. More people are going home, and possessions nine tenths of the law. People stay at home if we, when we get them home. So our numbers in social care are actually coming down as well in terms of care home places. We only work with the independent sector in terms of care homes and our partnership work with them and the care inspectorate through my home life leadership programmes, through the care about physical activity programmes is really strong. So I think when you you know when you, you're, you're loud and you actually have a, an influence over it, it doesn't mean to say that you want to attract all the money to yourself. It actually is how you see that money working right across your community planning partnership, not just the council and you know the health board. And I think we start to see that making a real difference in some of the work that we do. Very much, John uh, Thank you, convener. Um, I, I would genuinely say that Lanarkshire is committed to a whole system approach. I think where the differences are versus targets and the expectations um, of meeting some of those targets, they drive certain behaviours, and it's understandable. Certainly, um, for, from our perspective, I think uh, all four partners, and I mean the, uh, the Council, the Health Board, the IGB, and the third and independent sector, want the same thing. We genuinely want great outcomes for people. Um, I mentioned earlier about some of the, the behaviours of individuals, and I think there is still a cultural expectation that the state will provide and, and will provide a, a variety of services to a level of quality. I think the, we, we need to tackle uh, some of the inequality issues. And I have to say that, for me, some of the Fear of Scotland duties seem to clash a bit with base value. And when you sit in North Lanarkshire, where we've got areas of deprivation, one of the things would be to trust partnerships to invest where they think the greatest need is. So I realise what the needs are of my population, but often money comes with a tag on it that says you've got to invest it there. You, it, we are going to have to trust partnerships to invest for outcomes for people. 
And I think uh, to the detriment across the years, we haven't invested enough in prevention and early intervention. We haven't invested enough in some of the independent community support. So for me, uh, your question was, is there enough cash in the system? Uh, no, I would want more cash in the system uh, and I would genuinely want that to be given without tag so that we can trust partnerships. I absolutely am um, all up for scrutiny and performance. However, um, when money comes with tags, it restricts us greatly. So, um, yes, please, more cash but allow us to have the trust locally to identify the needs and invest in those needs. Rob McCulloch, yeah. um, The way the legislation is set up at the present time, it, it relies highly on relationships. Uh, and if relationships are not working at the senior level within the three main organisations, then it's just not going to work. Um, there isn't enough money in the system. Uh, you've got three uh, independent bodies, if you like, that are all accountable for their own budgets within that and at some points they are conflicted within there. And that's where it is working together in partnership is necessity to actually see us through. But I think the legislation at the moment is overcomplicated and it, in, unless it relies heavily on the relationships between those individuals and perhaps it relies too much on that. I think what my colleagues have said about moving towards in partnership is the only answer that we have and actually getting more into the prevention work and the partnerships are set up to do that is the only way we can start to manage the demand in our services. But there's a balance to be struck. We can take more resources out of the system if we manage that demand, but we've taken a significant amount out already. Uh, and looking at the pressures that all of the partnerships are under at the present time, I don't think there's enough money in the system to actually cover all of that. Much. Uh, Kate Forbes. Great. And that uh, leads up nicely to my questions around uh, efficiency savings. Are there particular services that you believe will be harder hit than others going forward looking for efficiency savings? And in its written submission, North Lanarkshire noted that um, it's challenging to continue to protect the budget supporting preventative and early intervention work. So I'd just be curious as to where you what your own uh, fears are about what will be what could be hardest hit going forward and how do you, are you intending to mitigate that who would like to start it's really a question for everyone i think yeah, happy go. Yeah. Okay. I, I think the the risk and i think it's a risk i'm certainly very aware of is that you know when you're look when you're under pressure when your budgets are under pressure you can default to soft targets as I would describe it. that's maybe not the best term but that, that's the one I'll use um, and things like the prevention end uh, versus high packages high cost packages of care for individuals who absolutely require that care is what is is, is the trade-off but there's a, there is a real danger that you lose sight of that long-term um, goal I think the other area is you know we often uh, default to support services such as admin and, and then you get a false economy in terms of what your clinical and practitioner staff are doing versus how they're appropriately supported. So I, I guess that goes back to being able to consider fully, you know, what is it you're trying to achieve? And I suppose our strategic plans commit to prevention for good reason. And we, we know that that's a long-term game and we need to keep going with that. But I think it comes back to some of the things that other people have said, is that isn't always about the direct budget that's there, um, the community resilience, the community groups that we've been able to tap into and the third sector that's already thriving um, are, are big players in, in, in how we have prevention you know, prevailing and community planning partners are playing a, 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 a big part in that. So when, when I'm thinking about the budget, it goes back to what Eddie said, we're part of a whole host a range of partnerships that bring a lot to the table and how do you maximize that to get the prevention end right firm in the middle because it, it, it's critical and for me that's things like the muddy growth deal how do we make sure that we are you know if, if that is to be successful that we are a key player and contributor and understand what that can bring to communities and um housing 
you know, for us, housing has been a massive uh, uh, transformational partner in what we've achieved in Murray. And in my submission, I've mentioned, you know, a couple of areas that that's had impact. And, and all that's prevention, because that's keeping people independent in their home and and well, you know, mentally well, rather than, than languishing somewhere they don't want to be. Hey, Fraser. So I would absolutely uh, agree with Pam around the contribution that, that housing can make. You know, uh, the, our strategic housing investment programme has already delivered a number of different projects that directly support wellbeing in the communities. Some of them have been more generally for, for older people in our communities, people who may be in, you know, like big tenancies, moving to buy new houses and freeing up the big tenancies for families. Others have been about, you know, like for people with high levels of need and people with really high quality, you know, housing with tech attached to it, choosing to go there. So it's not be forcing people to go there, it's people choosing to go there. And we've got a number of other projects coming along line in the Strategic Housing Investment Programme to, to deliver that. So it sees a change from people, maybe 10 people, all spread across, you know, the area, all having 24 hour one-to-one -one support, to people living in different models of care, where there still is 24 hour cover there on site at, at hand to them, but they don't all need that individual one-to-one -one support. And actually that is significant savings and also delivers more independence eh, for people. That bit about independence and inclusion, I think is a way that we need to manage demand rather than to talk about cuts. So when we have conversations now, we call it our community front door, when people first come to us and talk to us about social care services, we very much talk to them about what their priorities are. We talk to them the things about self-directed support should be about what control and what choice do they want around that. I think it's the same agenda in nursing to the, you know, the what matters to you. It's the same agenda in terms of realistic medicine. It's that conversation, different conversation that we're having with people. The output of that for us this year has been against a predicted 3% growth in terms of our social care services with a 1% reduction in terms of that. And this hasn't been about cuts. This has been about different conversations with people. And I think that's the important way we go. We actually talk to people about what's important to them and we make sure we deliver on that rather than us give more traditional, oh, you've got this level of need, so you've got three visits a day, seven days a week. It, that's not the type of support or the conversations that we're having. And I think we're really seeing, you know, rewarding returns from having the, the conversations. So again, it's about how we work with other people. It's how we work with people who are coming to us for services. It's how we work with communities. And it's how we work with the other providers that surround us, including housing in particular. Judith Proctor. Thank you. Um, I, I would, I, I, again, um, agree with, with, with my colleagues. Um, there's a project that's been underway in Edinburgh that's, that's showing some, some real benefits from just the approach that colleagues have been talking about where um, there have been high weights for an assessment where people have come forward um, with a, a, a view to having a, a need for health or social care um, and they've had to wait a long time to access that because of, of some of our uh, challenges with regard to the workforce availability and so on. And just taking that very different approach, which is working with people around what alternatives can we find? What assets are there in your community? What are the third and independent sectors? Sector, mostly third sector, voluntary sector um, offerings out there, people have had better outcomes. They've been able to be getting the support that they need, the companionship, the links into their community that's actually far more beneficial for them uh, in many ways than, than, than a statutory intervention. Obviously, those people who have a requirement for a statutory intervention, we've been able to move that one through. But we've managed to reduce both waiting lists and the subsequent need for a statutory intervention. And I think that's really important. Um, we often funnel people into service land as opposed to support them to, to, to find the links in their community, as I say, can often be more, more rewarding for them. In, in terms of of the, the, the question, I think one of the things that um, we would strive very, very hard to do is always balance the need for efficiencies with outcomes for people. Um, and one of the areas that I think can be uh, a challenge for us to, uh, to articulate is the transformational potential and the use of transformation funding. Um, I think one of the, 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 the difficulties around that is that the, the transformation program that we're dealing with is cultural. It is about new models. It is about the use of technology. All these things can take time to really embed and deliver the 
expected outcomes, including benefits to people and the efficiencies that we'll want to see. And it's often because that money seems to be sitting spare. Uh, that we can be under pressure uh, to, to, to justify. So I think we do need to have well-articulated transformation programmes with a vision of where we're going and a degree of courage and bravery to sit with that and ensure that we hold the line because that is the, that's the transformation potential that really, I think, is going to deliver sustainable uh, change in our system. Um, you, you asked what's the hardest hit. Uh, often the hardest hit are uh, things that don't have targets. So certainly for me, um, there, there is a view that where a target's attached and where there's an expectation to deliver, um, that drives, again, a set of behaviours. Uh, in my own budget, I've only got 46%, which is uh, uh, able to be challenged in around savings. So the rest is fixed. So it, it's quite an incredible amount of money um, that, that's already set and I can't take anything else from. So... Um, Set. Ooh, could you go into a bit more detail about yeah. so, the ways in which um, it can't be fixed fixed costs like care packages you can't right. take care away yeah. from 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 folks and and certainly those individuals those that are in care homes those of packages of care just now so it, it's quite a an interesting analysis when you start to look at how much you're able to uh, uh, take from the edges um certainly one of the things for me I see my own budget as an integrated budget, and that's not always seen by the two partner bodies as an integrated budget. So I would like personally to lose the labels from both of those budgets. So I invest, and sometimes I use social care money to invest in a model, sometimes I use health money. Now, at the end of the day, somebody has to do a ledger and accounts back that says, that's what we spent in health and that's what we spent in the council um, funding and, and, and any additional funding. But certainly from my perspective, I consistently see it as an integrated budget. And, and I, I, again, I would like to be able to have the ability in, to invest where I think w we need to. And just in terms of uh, some of the areas of investment, particularly around prevention, the first point of contact co colleagues have mentioned um, is pretty key. At that particular point, whether they've been known to us in the past or, or are brand new, that first point of contact is really, really key. At that particular point, we can take a view on folks' financial situations, their, their needs, their supports, and, and certainly direct people into prevention, self-management, information and advice, and, and we're not doing that well enough at the moment. I think self-management uh, is something that we really need to explore and invest in. And just to give you an example of some of that uh, in terms of managing demand and the, the self-management, uh, we've just uh, completed uh, a project in, in uh, North Lanarkshire, which this week won uh, the, the local NHS award because it was truly integrated between workforce of OTs, physios, uh, and some of the home support staff working together in one team, co-located, using one system, one had to use the other system. It was difficult and it was challenging. But what we did significantly in that particular uh, uh, project was we've managed the demand around waiting times. So we've not taken a cut, but we're managing more people through the system. Now, that's, that's a growth in itself. So that's really, really key. Now, the aspect of that is that people are getting a good service, but the self-management element of that and the use of technology perhaps in future around physio is that you would have your procedure and you would be given uh, electronic ways of, of managing. And, and certainly from our perspective, that would save visits to uh, the statutory services. So again, for us, just uh, some examples of where we've managed demand. Can I just clarify an earlier point um, that you made around uh, fixed costs so, and targets, that where costs are linked to targets, it's harder to uh, find efficiencies uh, there. So in terms of the, the split, I think it was, was it 47% that you said was um, not um, fixed costs? Mm -hmm. 
are, are, does that mean that they don't have targets attached as well? Uh, they do. Some of them do in terms of um, some of the things that, that, that we have to provide. Um, and certainly there are clearly more targets in one world that we live in rather than the other. Sometimes we, we talk about volumes uh, rather than specific targets. So some of those fixed costs also have targets or expectation of reduced demand or reduced growth. It sounds as if you're saying, though, that fixed costs, existing care packages can't be remodelled, where I think we heard something different from Eddie Fraser. I wonder so, if you'd respond so, to that. So I think, I think they can be remodelled. It's often very challenging when you sit with a family, and, and we've done exceptionally well around learning disability. We've done exceptionally well where we've remodelled uh, the care. But that takes a long time working with families. If we think of overnight support and overnight care, there is a genuine fear from families that we're taking something away as opposed to giving them something better. Um, indeed, even our own staff, I had a member of staff who who sat outside a client's house uh, when we moved to overnight care with technology, uh, just that anxious um, about the first time. And it's that trust that you build up in the whole system, being able to respond. So we can remodel packages, but uh, it's at the margins and often uh, families have to come with us on quite a long journey. Uh, Judith Proctor and then Pam it was just another example of the, 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 what we would see as fixed costs that we're unable to, to influence uh, changes on. It's, it's money that comes in with our budgets that pretty much just goes straight out again. And a good example of that would be the money tied up to uh, GP services. They're, they're largely fixed. And uh, whilst there is transformational uh, um, potential within how we shift primary care, that's not money that we're actively able to, to, to make a saving on. And it's a significant amount of the budget. I just wanted to kind of support some of the statements that uh, Janice has made about particularly around um, the, the complex packages around uh, people with learning disabilities and mental health. And that indeed working with individuals, a bit like I said, around the race, might, you know, that, that working with individuals to help them understand there are other ways that they can can experience the system it does take time and takes a lot of confidence building. It's not it's not a quick fix. But I, I think it would be quite useful to share with you one of the, the things I mentioned in the submission that, I, that is feeling really exciting in terms of learning for all of us. And we are having an academic piece of work uh, done around this. So in uh, Forest, uh, which is a small town um, to the west of, of uh, Murray, we had a residential uh, care unit for people with extreme autism and a uh, challenge in behavior so really at the high end of of of, of a uh, challenge and that was a really difficult environment um for people to be living in they were living with people that they choose not to live with uh, their families didn't have the privacy and the ability to interact in the way they, the way they perhaps wish to and uh, our recruitment retention was was pretty uh, bad although there was a core group of staff who stuck with that all the way through their dedication and these are home care uh, level staff really really dedicated and Murray Council before integration integration had started to, to address this on the basis of two objectives one was around recruitment retention one was around quality of life and optimizing these individuals uh, right to um, something better at the time when they were in the residential service they were we were averaging about 70 incidents of uh, assault on staff um, a, a month. So that's a lot of distress for the individuals involved and for the staff. So not a good situation. Um, last August, we opened um, brand new build bungalows that are all appropriately built to suit the needs of these individuals, the, the, the four individuals that were moving across in the first instance. And uh, technology enabled care, you know, they have privacy, they have that right to family life fulfilled because they have privacy, their own home and their families can come work with them. And they ha are within a community in these lovely, uh, uh, spacious and bright environments. Um, and we have recruited teams specific to their needs to work with them. And in the first six months, our incidents went down to one, uh, which was pretty minor. And now that will be a honeymoon period. The world, you know, we will have peaks and troughs in that. Our use of um, as required medications, I think it's seven. I haven't got the exact figure here. I can get them for you if you want. Seventy-three percent reduction in our use of as required medications. So that's money. Um, our restraint, hundred percent reduction in one restraint technique, and ninety-three percent reduction in, in another. And so it goes on in this very positive. And our recruitment has been really successful. We've had one person leave because they went on maternity leave. 
So that in the first, we're nearly coming up for a year, um, in, obviously in August, so we'll be able to have a really good uh, data set around this. Um, since then, we, uh, and I think this is really important from a budget perspective, because we're all um, spending out lots of money on in, in out-of-area placements, we have repatriated um, uh, 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 individuals who could be costing us around 600 to a million pounds a year out of area down south placement. Now, in a budget my size, that's a scary number. Um, and you haven't got the connection and you haven't got the control over everything that go, the, the, that's happening there. Plus, for the family, that this can be significant travel to try and see them. And we've successfully uh, brought people back into these bungalows who have been in those circumstances um, and interestingly we are having positive results in terms of quality of life no further incidents all things that actually from a practitioner perspective felt very high risk from a professional perspective in traditional models were, were kind of scary prospects and um, so there was a little bit of boldness there and a little bit of you know um, going forward and we're we're really interested to to understand all the factors and hopefully for colleagues mm. that will be be helpful i know others have mm. got um similar results but i just think it, it kind of hopefully shows some a way you can achieve quality um, but you can still have that right to family life and you can still make savings. So uh, the average cost now uh, for these people who have their own tenancies, these are their own houses, um, uh, is about 250000 so again, making money go further, better quality. That you know, there are examples of this that we, we are starting to understand. Thank you very much. A really brief uh, supplementary just um, at towards Edinburgh. In terms of the, and you may have touched on this already, but in terms of the budgeted savings in 2017-18, which were not reported um, in terms of achievement, does, is that going to have um, serious implications for uh, planned savings this year? Um, we we have had a where well, we will be reporting a balanced budget uh, for the for the close of the last year uh, finance, but that's be been as a result of increased investment from both NHS Lothian and City of Edinburgh Council in recognition of some of the the, the, the pressures and also in support of the wider transformation that we're we're trying to to achieve. Uh, the budget forecast efficiency that we're looking for this year is a target of 20.2 million uh, pounds, and we've identified. 14.9 million of that so we still have a gap in terms of identified savings and as colleagues have um, also identified we have a, a savings program uh, and scrutiny process in place in relation to the deliverability of, of, of savings in year I think as you're you're you're, you're pointing out non-delivered savings this year lead to additional pressure next year because we will have savings to make then so uh, if we have unidentified or non-delivered savings it is of concern just why from a, an operational perspective we, we apply a lot of scrutiny to that. The additional investment last year, one-off? Um, um, I don't have the detail entirely on that one. We haven't concluded that. Um, there's an element of both recurring and non-recurring within that. Okay. Thank you. Brief supplementary, Sandra White. Much. I was very interested in what Pam Cowens has said about the, the savings and, and looking at new issues. Uh, I just wondered how difficult it is to change culture if you have families and obviously it's high-cost packages. Uh, is it a reassessment of their needs every year, every two years, whatever? Just, you know, basically just something sharp <laughs> to let me know how you work that out. Because obviously, I'm sure all of us have families come to our constituencies saying this is not good for my child. Uh, and it's a real high end. So how do you make budget savings? Do you reassess every year or every two years? What is, is better for the person involved? So um, we reassess at least every year and likely more regular than that. I think often with some of these transformational changes, it's really no other professionals that folk want to hear from. You know, like, uh, it's really the families of other folk who have actually transitioned into different things. And, you know, like, um, so I am a carer. I'm a carer for a 19-year-old son with, with autism. And if anyone came to me and said, it'll be OK, you know, like Callum can just spend all night himself, I would just laugh at them. You know, like, so there's the bit about you having to actually see and trust what's happening, you know, and that's how we need to work with, with families. So they need to see how it has worked for other people. And so we have had some of the trailblazers, if you want to call it, who have changed and they've done things differently. People have got a different type of life. They're not sitting one-to-one -one support if you're sitting in a house with someone with a paid carer 24 hours a day. 
A woman with learning disability explained that to me as being with the boss. She said that as someone who was the boss over her all the time. She explained to me that she felt she had more freedom when she lived in an NHS facility where she could go to the day room with other patients and sit and watch the telly, that nobody had any power over her as a, more, a better environment for her than sitting with a paid carer all the time. So actually trying to find somewhere in the middle of that. So some of these housing models that we're doing, people have their own tenancy, they have their own space, but they're also close by all the supports they require. And that's the goal that, that, that we work with. But you're absolutely right in saying how you work with people, how you work trust. And because everyone's aware of the current financial challenges environment, people think when you're getting in the door, your purpose in getting in the door is to make cuts. And so it's a big persuasion about Yes, we want, we do, no point in kidding it, we do want to reduce the cost, but we want to reduce it in a way that gives people at least as much independence and is absolutely a safe way of delivering things. Um, people want control of their own lives, and a lot of the services that we're inputting now uh, contain an element of reablement. So if someone has a hospital visit, we want to get them back on their feet as soon as possible, back towards as much of their normal life. Uh, and in the borders, we've introduced a uh, discharge to assess policy. So we want to do that assessment in a place which is familiar to them, usually their home, or at least a, a homely environment within that. So we can find out how can they actually start cooking again, get out the front door again, start their lives again within that. So and it's really putting the, the power and the onus back on the individual um, to get better within that, rather than actually taking care of everything and for the state to take care of everything. So it's a real cultural shift. So we're fortunate in the borders that we have a coterminosity between the NHS board, the council and, and the IGB, of course, within that. And so we're able to work in very close partnership. And there's a real ownership between all of the chief execs and the officers within that of the, the challenges that are faced right across the whole of the partnership. And the solutions for some of the challenges we're getting in NHS lie within the council and vice versa. So we are trying that shift of the balance of care. And one of the things that the borders have been successful at is introducing uh, housing with extra care. So as Eddie was saying, we've got a whole range now of uh, um, facilities that individuals can get into within that, and it's a choice that we're trying to put on. Uh, just one very quick example, using self-directed support, we've got much more flexibility for people as to how they get the care and support that they actually require within that. And we need people to be much more imaginative around what it is that's going to be good for them. An example that I had from uh, a previous role elsewhere was that a social worker was dealing with mental health issues around uh, a middle-aged woman, and it was she was constantly visiting the GP, getting antidepressants, and this was going on for, for a number of years. Years. But what was the solution to that was actually giving her a puppy and that she actually started walking the dog, she was getting out the door, she was meeting people, she was joining clubs and she was out of that isolation. Now that was a really ingenious move I think on an individual who had the freedom of a budget that she could use in a different way. And I think that's what we're all trying to do with the community itself. So the state doesn't need to provide everything, we actually try to provide opportunities for individuals to look after themselves. And it's a real shift in culture and a real shift in policy, uh, both between councils, NHS and the IGBs themselves. Thank you very much. Uh, because I think the cultural uh, change is, is significant and long term uh, and some part of that we all work with and, and are supported by tremendous staff across health and social care and in the third and independent sector but sometimes that cultural change needs to sit, sit with our staff who have been trained in a particular methodology uh, so we need to support them in, in having those courageous and different conversations and I think as important to that our IGBs, our, our governing bodies, our local authorities, our health boards need to have the approach risk enablement approaches that enable staff to work in that very, very different way, because sometimes that's the, that's the thing. And Janice talked about a member of staff nervously sitting out somebody, outside somebody's house. Our staff want to do the right thing, and we need to, through our governance and our culture, ensure that they're able to do, to do that within that, that, that new way of working. Thank you very much. Ash Denham. Thank you, convener. Good morning to the panel. It's been very interesting hearing from you all so far. I just want to move um, the conversation on a little bit to the idea of longer term budget setting. So, and whether this five year health and social care um, financial framework will assist you in that longer term planning. And if so, if you think it will, what level of detail you think um, would have to be in the financial framework in order to support you with this meaning, you know, a meaningful level to support you with that longer term financial planning? Eddie Fraser. 
I, I think um, I, I spoke earlier around having a you know a strategic plan, a financial plan, a workforce plan, and a property and asset manager. You know, like, if you don't know what your financial plan is over the forthcoming years, it's very difficult to have a workforce plan. It's very difficult to see what you want to invest in in terms of not just buildings, but also in, in tech, in terms of, of where you want to go. So for us, you know, having a three to five year, you know, like forward look in terms of what our budget is, we estimate it just now in our, our strategic plans, but it's purely an estimate because it's annual budgeting that we're getting. But to really to be able to do that and see how will we do this differently? How can we plan a different thing about how many, you know, like different types of workers that we will have in three years' time? How does, you know, like the, the universities and colleges know, you know, like what, how many of each different type of profession to train unless we can collectively have that workforce plan to do it? So, so that, the other part that it gives us is when working with the third sector, be able to give them more surety. So again, if we're getting financial planning on an annual basis, often you'll see fairly short-term contracts with third sector. In terms of the longer-term financial surety that we have, we can give longer-term surety to some of the really effective preventative things that, that we can do. So, so it is about joining these different things together. I really want to say we can't do strategic planning just now because actually the reality is that our budgets will only move by a few percent every year. So, so you do know 95% plus what you're going to get every year, but really, I mean, they're big budgets, so that last 5% is quite a lot of money. So, so you can do financial planning, you can do strategic planning, but you can't do it to the level of surety that you would want to give all the partners unless you have a longer-term financial plan. John is short. If I do ask anything, it's to implore for guaranteed approximates. So if you, if you can guarantee, I think Eddie's uh, hit upon it, we... we overall know roughly what we're getting it's it's that what you have to save and the pain you have to go through politically and with families and with trade unions and with staff if that's guaranteed that can be a very managed transition what we do is we hit we hit we hit that managed transition makes it far easier to have negotiations with trade unions and staff, far uh, uh, greater conversations with families, far greater conversations with local politicians who will have to manage the expectations as well. So I, I think all of that together. So a five-year assured um, approximate would be really, really great for us. We talked about workforce, we talk about skill mix, we talk about the time it takes to train doctors, to train AHPs, to train new skills into workforce. That's three to five years. Every every year I'm trying to work out how many nurses I can afford, how many social workers I can afford. If I've got that on a managed basis and strategically plan it, that would have a huge difference uh, to health and social care. Judith okay. Proctor. Um, it, it's related, but it's, it's maybe not uh, completely to the point of the question, but it was really to pick up. Both my colleagues have mentioned the issue of the workforce and workforce planning has been really, really key to this and to the wider transformation. Um, I, I think one of the other things that can be incredibly helpful, um, whilst the, the focus on individual IGB areas and localism is really, really important, where there are some things that we can be doing at a regional basis or indeed at a national basis to support the development of the workforce, I think that's really important. And I think one of those areas where we could be working at a higher level is around the, the, the delivery of the numbers of new roles that we need as a result of the, the national workforce plans. Um, I, we would be able to do that as a, as a group of, of uh, health and social care partnerships right the way across Scotland. The balance then of how we're able to attract them to our individual areas obviously would be um, up to, to local areas. But if we know that we're needing to train additional pharmacists to manage that shift in the, the balance, um, I think the negotiation Associations and the influence to actually achieve that end result is far greater if it's done on a national or certainly a, a, a level higher than individual IGBs. I think that's where we'll see real traction and that would go across all, all specialisms and professions. Thank you. Uh, I think the biggest gain of going over a longer term, so three years or five years, is you can plan your savings over that length of time. So you know the pressures that are you're going to be hitting over five years, so you can stagger when you're going to take the biggest hit on the budget or when you're going to pass it off into the next year. It's just being able to forward plan. Um, I'm 
echo echoing what others have said. It's about confidence in decision making, and for, and for me, it's the critical conversations that you have when you're out with communities in terms of having a real conversation about well, here's the kind of trajectory we're on. Here's the kind of you know the the system that we need to try and um, redesign. That being able to do that with some confidence around clear parameters, because I've certainly found myself in a couple of occasions. I suppose holding my nerve in terms of whether to move ahead with something, a decision that's that's difficult or not, on the basis, you know, is it at this point we really need to make that decision or have we got longer to have the right conversations? So I think that certainty gives confidence. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much, Brian. But yeah, Bina, uh, good morning. Can, can I uh, ask around the, the linkages between uh, budgets and outcomes? Um, I mean, integrated authorities are expected to contribute to those those uh, nine uh, health, national health and wellbeing outcomes. Uh, in fact, it's a legislative requirement that you, that you report against these outcomes. I think in previous reports, the committee have have uh, have had concerns around that sort of awareness of these reporting requirements and, and sort of lack of, of, of progress towards that. And, and I was struck by. Uh, in the submission from North Lanarkshire, that that apparent tension, and if I, if I may quote, saying that the, uh, linking expenditure directly to one specific outcome does not capture the fact that the budget supports these, supports a range uh, of outcomes, and attempting to allocate specific funding to each outcome may be notional and therefore less meaningful. And I think we want to get obviously it's a legislative requirement. Um, we want to have that min meaningful reporting. Uh, so I wonder you know, what progress is being made uh, in linking budgets to outcomes and, and, and complying with that le legislative requirement in, in this particular area. <coughs> I would like to start. <laughs> okay, well, happy to, uh, to answer. So in, in terms of a partnership like uh, our own, uh, who have children and justice in it, as well as the nine you know, incomes, uh, outcomes for uh, wellbeing, we also have three for children and three for justice. And they're right up front on their strategic plan saying this is what we're, we're trying to, to do. We then translate them across into, so what's our, our priorities in terms of doing that? And mapping them against the, you know, the national outcomes. And for us, it's giving our children the best start in life. It's making sure we promote healthy living, health improvement. We give good services, good access to services, and we address you know, inequalities, particularly health inequalities. So we take the national outcomes and we talk to local communities about how do we map them across, and then we work you know, on them in terms of how we map them across. I think what Janice said earlier is one of the distractions you know, at times. If you get something that's very high focus to us, you know, like for instance, delayed discharge or whatever, then that can become a distraction for you to be able to deliver others. Your challenge to us, and I'm in a good position around this. If you reach a page place where you're very much in control of the hospital discharge and people come out er early, then you can start to focus on the other things. And I think the focus on the other things and the well-being agenda, which is very much the core of the outcomes, is where you'd really get into partnership work with communities. That's where it, and it's not, it's how we work together with people, you know, like, I think you'll be aware of some of the vibrant communities teams that we have in East Ayrshire and some of the work we do there, some of the work that we do in some of our, the opportunity services to actually give people the opportunities, and it's actually there you see the real outcomes. You see the real outcomes and then come back. I think you're right in terms of saying, do we then write down for us the, the overall 15 you know, national outcomes and actually map against all that. We likely don't do that clear, clearly enough. But I think what we do is in terms of our planning, and you can actually see it going through that. But I, I think you, there's something in that there that, that we don't actually map directly across to do that. Just one very brief comment. Um, we seem to trust numbers, but we don't trust narrative. Mm -hmm. There's some great stories out there about the interventions health and social care has made. Yeah. So why do we trust numbers and at times where some of those targets are process targets? They're absolutely not about the outcome. So why do we trust numbers and we don't trust narrative? Fair question. Uh, Judith Proctor and then Pam Gowns. Yes, I, I think it is important that we actually demonstrate outcomes both through you know, the, 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 the numbers and the targets, but I, th I think crucially, as Janice has just touched on, the experience, you know, the lived experience of people and improved, improved lives for communities and individuals. Um, I think it is possible to, to track that, and I, and I, and I think it, it, it talks to the point of the challenge around um, balancing the transformation potential and what we're trying to do in the longer term and the efficiencies that we 
must make now. Um, because if we're able to demonstrate the, um, that, that new ways of working and the, the, the changes that we're putting in place will significantly improve our ability to achieve those outcomes with, with people, then we have a good, solid argument for investing in that and, and, and pre preserving. Certainly in my, my previous role, we had our transformation programme tracked against delivery against those outcomes and in the business case process, uh, there had to be a clear demonstration of alignment both to the IJB strategic plan and achievement of those nine, nine outcomes or, or a number of them, and then the, the measures of success that sit underneath that. I think that gives far greater persuasion in relation to the board and in, in drawing in uh, new funding and preserving transformation programmes if you're demonstrating um, the ability to, 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 to shift the balance in that way. So I think it is really, really important, but I would absolutely, again, agree that it, we have to be drawing more and more on these stories of, of how, um, it, how, from a narrative perspective, people are experiencing services differently because that gives people confidence that, for example, new technology can be an improvement rather than seen as a substitute for a service. So I think that they're both really important. Yeah, I suppose it's really timely again in, in terms of how learning how to do that well. And we, we have our annual performance reports that will be due out again this year. And I, certainly from a Murray perspective, the, this is the dialogue we're having is well, we pre, you know, published for the public what we published last year and tried to put a lot of stories in it because we, and I think most people did the same. In fact, we, we, we took our learning from Eddie, actually. We uh, looked at what, what had been done in Ayrshire and tried to, to, to learn from that. Um, and we are again looking at, well, how can we improve on that and how can we absolutely start to really demonstrate something that brings to life what we're trying to do for people in a meaningful way, whilst not, um, not acknowledging that we aren't getting everything right and we still have to learn in those cases where we haven't done as good a job or people haven't had that experience what the difference is that we need to make to to, op to optimize so i think our annual performance reports and how we articulate those are, are our vehicle we're still trying to work out the best way to make that meaningful but but again with us it's been stories we, that people seem to have appreciated Robert McCullough, yeah. understood the question correctly and i may not have um it it's very difficult to allocate a, a specific budget to a specific action that's got a specific outcome within that. All of our actions actually hit all of the outcomes in the majority of cases within that. Just a quick example in the borders, we've introduced community hubs uh, and these operate within the major towns within the borders and it gives access to a whole range of services within health, within well-being, within social services, but wider than that, housing and the voluntary sector. And it hits a, a huge number of outcomes. Now, if I was to allocate the funding specifically for that and divide it up into the outcomes, I'm not sure of the value in that. But it's important we are scrutinised against the outcomes and we demonstrate how we're actually uh, meeting them and working towards them. But actually allocating specific aspects of funding to a specific outcome, I don't think it's actually going to be that helpful. Follow on from that. I think the, the Cabinet Secretary quite fairly recognised to the committee the challenges uh, uh, that are faced in trying to do exactly what you said there um, and, and giving that sort of you know, that legislative imperative that, that we do report there. I just wonder what, what support you're getting from the Scottish Government. Is it enough uh, 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 in terms of developing a, a reporting structure that, uh, to, that, that, that allows that process to be much more transparent? Any brief thoughts, Eddie Fraser? I think, you know, our dealings with the Scottish Government are across a number of different parts of health, to be honest. So our relationships with the, the integration support team, you know, it, it tends to be strong. And then different chief officers take a lead across Scotland in different things. So, so so I do some of the lead in primary care. So again, I'm linked into the primary care teams. You know, we've got mental health. We've clearly got some of the performance teams that engage with us around delayed discharge in the four-hour A&E. So the specific area that gives us really the support around that is the integration you know, like team in terms of Scottish Government and throughout this whole process they have been a huge support to us in, in terms of what we do. If there are any difficulties at all in local areas, the willingness to come out and talk with us, either as groups of IGIBs or be brokers with health boards and that. So the relationship we have there is positive, it's strong you know, in terms of the work that we have there. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Ivan McKee. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks convener and thanks uh, panel for a very interesting um, discussion this morning. The area I wanted to focus on was around about shifting the balance of care, and we've kind of touched on that to some extent already. Um, I suppose it's just to take it up a level and 
have a look um, from where you're sitting, from where you see the numbers. Is there a shift in terms of spend? Is that happening? Can you see it happening? Um, or is it difficult to see to see actually flowing through? I mean, we've been given some data here, and we've got I, uh, integration authority budgets chunked into four groups. I don't know if this is something you would recognise in terms of the way it's broken up, but it's social care, it's family health services and prescribing, it's community health care, and it's hospital. Now, that's just IA, so the hospitals, I'm assuming, wouldn't include what the health boards on their own are spending on hospitals. But when we look at that, you would say the one that would be acute, I would imagine, would be hospitals. We actually see that going up. Um, social care we see coming down. Family health we see coming down. Community health care we see going up. So it's kind of, in some ways, almost the opposite direction to what we would have expected. So that's at a macro level. I'm interested to know at, at your local level, are you, what are you seeing in terms of the way the, um, the budgets are shifting? Judith Proctor. Just to start, um, I think there are some areas in, in Edinburgh where there's been uh, quite a, a dem demonstrable shift in the balance of care in relation to the, the, the balance around mental health and learning disabilities. I think some significant success there, and that will have built on a number of years of, of the direction of travel where we're trying to support people out of institutional settings and into the kind of homely tenancies that, that, that Pam and other have, have described. And that's seen us being able to close acute sector beds. Um, our ability, however, to, to um, take the, the, the change in investment and reinvest that in the community, I, I think, has been challenging probably across Scotland in everything that we do. So we may see the, 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 the models shift, um, but the, the, the challenge that we're often presented with from colleagues in uh, our, our acute sector, hospital sector, NHS uh, side, is that the costs, of course, of, of uh, acute provision are largely seen to, to be rising. And I think that's part of the challenge with the, what's known as the large set-aside set budget, uh, where a, a a, a shift has been made in relation to the balance of the care and support and the models, uh, we're not always able to actually in, in release the, 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 the notional cash uh, and reinvest that in, in the community. And, and to that end, there is a, a national um, integration finance development group that, that, that's looking at supporting that discussion uh, and conversation across Scotland. Is that health inflation in the acute sector is higher than it is... In the community sector? It, not only, it's for a whole, whole, whole host of factors, including elements of um, managing rotas to ensure that they are fully compliant in, in regard to working time directive, cost of overheads within the acute sector, cost of new drugs and so on that we've also talked about. So it's, it's wrapped up in, a, in a, a, a range of complexities, but there's some very um, productive conversations happening. The, the, the group's chaired by Christy McLaughlin. It's looking at really unpacking some of that complexity so that we can really understand it uh, and really begin to to think how, how we could be supported to achieve that shift in the balance of care if we're able really to deliver those, those new models okay. that are safe and effective in the community. How do we manage that release? Any further? I suppose just reflecting also what Judith said, I mean, we have just completed our, our third year of fully operational as an IGIB. Uh, when we map our numbers against the ministerial strategic group indicators, we can show reductions in unscheduled care, bed usage in acute hospitals and mental health facilities and geriatric long stay significant reductions in the last two. But there's no money released to come across from acute towards us in relation to that because, you know, our hospitals are still very busy. And I think the committee knows that, you know, there are additional beds open in there, so there are and to meet some of the demand around that. So although we're seeing a reduction there, if you work in, you know, a, a board area where there are a number of partnerships, not just one partnership actually feeds into an acute hospital. So the hospital is still busy. And in fact, it's, it's, it's too busy, you know, just now. And that's the work that we're, we're doing around that. So though we're starting to see a shift, it's not of the scale yet that actually releases resource. And I think it's fair to say reflected across, we'll likely see more of a shift in terms of that geriatric long stay and some of the mental health, which are actually over within our control rather than against the set aside budgets. So some of them are areas that we'll be able to really make a shift on eh, rather than, you know, let's shift the, the acute side. Yeah, just if you don't mind. So uh, uh, are you kind of saying that you're doing your bit, but the other IAs in the board aren't doing their bit, or are you saying that the demand is such, regardless across the whole area, that whatever bed you free up will get filled because this demand's flowing through? And as a follow-up to that, are you then saying that we're kind of chasing our tail here and it's a bit of an unachievable goal to, to, to say that we can shift the balance of care? 
I think we need to be realistic. I think we can shift the balance of care. And I think we're, we're already shifting the balance of care. You know, like I've worked in, in East Ayrshire for 20 years now. And when I first came to East Ayrshire, we had three community hospitals, uh, predominantly full with, with older, real older people. We had 150 more older people in care homes than we have uh, just now. At that time, a uh, delayed discharge uh, in East Ayrshire was how many people you had over six weeks, and we had over 100 uh, over six weeks. We've now not had anyone who's been a delayed discharge, you know, over two weeks for eight years or whatever. We now have one community hospital. As I say, we've got 150 less people in, in care homes. We have shifted the balance of care. Who's well, shown that? It, the financials uh, are shown it in terms of the overall investment over that period okay. that you have in the, the community. The pressure on our hospitals, mm -hmm. because many of the older people are now living at home, and they do get unwell, and they need to go in and they need to access in and out you know, the hospital. Our challenge, and it's our purpose as integration joint boards, is to make sure that we're able to establish the right type of community services that both our GPs and our fa the local families and acute have trust that actually people can be supported in a, in a different way. Just now the numbers around the number of people and the pressure on the acute hospital are not such that there's a resource to be released out that. You know, I get, again, you know, I know committee knows for us or Naren, uh, our first you know, the thing is actually to bring that into financial balance before we actually then can move on to start saying how do you actually start to shift, you know, that money around. So we are seeing the activity change and that right across Scotland, if you look at these numbers, there'll be a similar pattern across Scotland, but actually getting that right. shift of money out of yeah. hospital. So I, I, I'm sorry to drill that, but I this is an important point. Uh, so uh, is, it, is it the reality then that if we weren't doing all the things we were doing to work on it towards integration, things would be going backwards? Yes. And, uh, and just by the virtue of the fact that you're standing still, you're actually making progress. So, so sometimes we work hard to mitigate, you know, some of the demands, you know, that, that mm -hmm. come towards us. And actually, it's where, you know, that we bend the curve. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the demand on acute would be much steeper if we weren't doing what yeah. we were doing. Okay. But it, it gets us into almost a false conflict between, you know, community and acute. Both sides are really, really busy. And on the whole, both sides are doing appropriate things. But we can change it. Some of the change has to be that medium to longer terms. They big public health priorities. Mm -hmm. So as the health of our populations are stronger. And again, you know, that's where IGIB sometimes we can get drawn into talking about this part of the, you know, the services part of the budget all the time. Where really some of the biggest gains that you'll get out of IGIBs is when we're working up there, and if I can call it the health improvement, public health part, actually supporting communities, being involved in communities. You know, some of the things about encouraging through participatory budget and allotments, you know, like different, you know, like clubs and things like that, that we've been able to do, is where you start to see a change in the health of the population that for the future will reduce demand. It's followed by Janice Hewitt. Yeah, probably just making a few points that echo what Eddie said. I mean, I looked back over the, the last 10 years in Murray and uh, we've had a 20% reduction in the bed basin in acute and uh, a 10% increase in over 65 uh, populations. So, uh, yet we've generally maintained quite a, a, a really good performance in terms of admissions and, and uh, the uh, delayed discharges. We've been struggling a bit in the last year. It's been peaks and troughs, but we're, we're trying to work through what's what's causing that at the moment. But generally, a really good performance against that kind of uh, start. But I think uh, what we've tried to be, and I think others have done the same, is you, you, in, in a sense, that idea that you're going to move the cash is quite challenging, and it's good that we're trying to work through and see if there's a different way to approach that. But we can still have the right conversations that perhaps change the way we all work together. And, and a lot of that, and most of us will have examples of this, where um, for frail elderly, your, your geriatric medicine, your old age psychiatry resource, both in and out of hospital, can come out into the community. And again, confidence in decision making, more prompt decision making, that if you don't have that level of expertise around, won't happen and will keep people in hospital. So you're maybe not moving the cash, but you're moving the resource and you're making a more streamlined community hospital service. And I think that is absolutely doable in a whole host of things. But we could look back in the last 10, 15 years 
um, in primary care through the local enhanced services, the number of activities that were traditionally delivered in acute hospital settings that happen in general practice now is immense. We have loads of stats on that, but that was through a particular investment route that wasn't uh, immediately taking money out of acute, mm -hmm. and, and, but it was shifting that 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 uh, activity. However, the activity has continued to rise that, that, that that's, uh, goes in through acute as well. So it's, it's, it is challenging, but there are possibilities, and hopefully we've given you a flavour of some of those today. Uh, thank you, Convener. The, the, the hospitals equally have more demands on them just now. The, the increase in more elective, the, the reducing the number of bed days, the turnaround. So we're equally working with a system where there's demands on the acute side as well, with the expectation of, of shifting the balance of care. Certainly, um, uh, for me, one of our biggest challenges, uh, Eddie's already mentioned the two words, trust and scale, for me. So um, I think the uh, real opportunity of integration for me is that understanding now where the hospitals know what's available and have that trust with either primary care or, say, uh, uh, or within the community care sector that they can let individuals go and, and they will be treated uh, with respect and have the, the due care in the community. That, there's still some anxiety about letting individuals go with not having a full package of care in place. That is it going to be safe? Uh, is uh, Mrs. Smith, Mrs. Jones going to be looked after as well as? So some of that cultural changes with uh, some of our uh, uh, very, very experienced consultants and nurses. But I think as we shift some of the workforce changes, we've got an investment in advanced uh, practice nurses. Uh, they're making a significant significant difference, the investment in treatment rooms uh, locally and those services being known to the community. Our biggest challenge going forward is unscheduled care and uh, uh, colleagues have mentioned that and where we can invest in hospital at home or where we can invest in community resources with social work staff, physio staff, AHPs and nurses all working collectively as a team, we will absolutely manage that unscheduled care. But that's the next challenge because a lot of that front door activity is determining what happens in the hospital as well. So scale for me and trust are the two things. So you mentioned scale and that trust to let go and let the community look after uh, people where they want to be. So I think we've seen a shift, uh, an increase in the number of people have been cared in the community right across the whole of the country within that, but we've also seen an increase in demand in the hospitals. And, and just to give you a, a, um, an insight to the level of the increase, so by 2032 in the borders, we expect the number of over 65-year-olds to go up by 62%. The number of 75-year-olds by 2032 will go up by 120%. Now, you just have to extrapolate that back. And year on year, we're getting increased pressure in our whole system within there. So I think what you're um, about chasing the tail was the comment you made. Um, We'll never catch the tail um, because the pressure is on both. Without the work of the partnerships, I think the hospitals would have fallen over by now. Uh, and the work that we're actually doing about shifting people into the community and caring for where they want to be cared for uh, is the right thing to do. And I think we've demonstrated that in bucket loads over the last three years of doing it. And that shared endeavour between the councils and the health boards, the local health boards, is, is clearly demonstrable now. If you go around the, the country, you will see many, many examples of where uh, councillors and non-executive directors are sharing the same agenda and making a significant difference. Just an example on the eastern region, uh, we have my own chief exec in the council who's taking a lead role on combating diabetes 2 across the whole of the region. So that's the uh, council chief exec taking that lead role because most of the services that actually uh, are about healthy lifestyles are actually held within the council. So ledger services, education, access to good housing, those are all council services. And here we have an example where the IGB has given a platform and an agenda that can be shared between those two. And if you're going to share, you're going to get efficiencies and you're going to improve quality and you're going to get a better outcome for the residents. Yeah, thanks. I mean, summary, it's almost like we talk about shifting the balance of care, but it's almost like we should better describe it as maintaining the balance of care. Sounds like a better way of describing it. But thank Indeed. You. Thank you very much. Uh, Sandra White. 
you very, very much, Convener. Uh, good morning, as you said that earlier, earlier on. Um, Ivan McKee's questions neatly bring me on to, obviously, integration, which is really, really important. And I was quite amazed at some of the comments, uh, you know, about trust, and particularly by hospitals, consultants, trusting to, to go over to community services as well. I mean, there's still a perception out there, perhaps even a professional, apart from the public, that you have funding in a budget which is health mm -hmm. and you've got funding in a budget which is social care. And neither of the two will meet. And I think, in fact, I think uh, Janice, you, you're a council in North Lanarkshire, anyway, said the current system encourages the funding to work through both local authority ledgers, to say, and the health board ledger. The funding does not therefore lose its identity uh, and was intended as was intended by the legislation. Uh, would you agree with that in that respect? And how do we... Well, I know you've mentioned about changing it, but would you agree with that, that that is actually what's happening? And I think when you're talking about acute care, it seems to be that, you know, the IGBs are doing a great job, and I don't envy the job you've got. Uh, they're doing a great job, but whilst you're, as you said previously, getting people out into community care, you're not getting the funding from the health board budget to help your budget so I, I said earlier and I would I would reinforce that health and social care is only going to become successful when you can't see the lines when you can't see the lines between the budget that was that had came with a health ticket has lost its identity <coughs> came with a council ticket lost its identity at the end of the day someone will do the accounting mm -hmm. and the ledgers at the end let us a uh, 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 put that resource as an integrated budget. And and uh, we will only become successful when you can't see the lines in the workforce as well. Mm -hmm. So ditch the, the lanyards that say NHS and the council because mm -hmm. we are absolutely skill mixing beyond anything anybody understood. Some of the challenges are around uh, us uh, using technology, some of the challenges are still around the organisational differences mm -hmm. and some of that resentment is still there and we have to acknowledge that from staff and trade union sides as well. But success will only come when you can't see the lines between the money, the workforce, the organisation and the strategic planning and that's across the whole system. Mm -hmm. I, do so. I think where you really see uh, the resources working best it's when they've almost came to us in a, in a joint way. Mm -hmm. And you start to see some of that being used right out in the third sector uh, as, as well. So we've got the integrated care fund. We've always had resource transfer. So in my own area, you know, like I've always been getting 10 million pounds off the health board that I spend in social care services for other hospital beds that have closed. The new monies for social care, whether they've come through health or the local authority, I've came to the integration joint board as new monies to look at. I think a particular success for us has been the alcohol and drug partnership money mm -hmm. that actually we see sitting under community planning. So although I lead on it, it's a wider. And that whole money, for me, it's about 1.6 million. We sit and we have an overall discussion with all the partners on how we do it. That's and great. I see good you know, steps being taken forward and the new money's coming for us in relation to primary care in terms of how we work with local GPs and the wider system. So it, it has been quite hard to move some of the established budgets across because traditionally, both within the council and within the health board, people still think of them and they still have an ownership of them. Yeah. Uh, of them. So it's not actually a bad thing. They actually have an ownership of them and they've just not been able to, to let go. But when new monies have come to us, that's when we've been able to be innovative and actually think of things uh, differently and mm -hmm. um, how we do it. Even how you know like our integration schemes are, are written. So ours is written to say that both partner bodies will take account of demographic challenges. Well, they think of that in their own heads of what demographic challenges mm. are, not that then it all gets thrown into a pot. So if the council think we've got this real demand coming for social care, so it's be £2 million that we'll give across to the IJB, if they suddenly then see me putting more district nurses out for it, <laughs> they're not going to be that happy because of you know, the, the decision. So it is that bit about new monies coming to us. We feel able to be more innovative around some of the established budgets. It's harder to actually do the change on. Mm -hmm. 
uh, again, I would, I, would, I would agree with everything that's been said, and I think what's really important, it comes back in some ways to you know, the vision thing. What is it that we're all signing up to do here? What are we all trying to achieve? And I think largely we're all trying to achieve the, the same thing for our populations, for people, and, and for communities. And if we can demonstrate that the investment of whichever bit of money it is is actually going to achieve that outcome uh, for people. Um, I think that then creates the persuasive argument that it doesn't matter and the accountancy bit happens uh, behind you know, the issues of, of two ledgers and so on, that happens behind. But if we can agree that the best approach is to take NHS money and to fund different housing models that are provided by the third sector and it's going to deliver an outcome that we're all signed up to that would improve um, pressure on the whole system, that's self-evident evidently is the right thing to be doing, the issue of the money shouldn't shouldn't matter. And I think that, that that's part of the, the challenge for us and our roles, which are great jobs, uh, is to is to, to to create that narrative and, and that vision and 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 that uh, exert that influence. Can I just make, Sorry. Can I just make another uh, point just on that one? With new money, it's slightly controversial to what, what Eddie says, with new money, don't give a don't give it a label. I know you want certain things done. But don't give it a label because I know my communities, I know where I need to invest. In terms of alcohol and drug money, I know I've got particular issues against needs. So with new money, while sometimes it's helpful to have a label, I'm, I'm possibly standing out here just to say, don't label new money. <clears throat> Pam Gardens. Yeah, I'd probably echo everything that everybody else has said. I th and, and we are on a journey. You know, we are on a trajectory of, of improvement. And I think, like Eddie said, with new monies, we've probably all got good examples of where when you've brought the integrated team together and say, go away and think about how we might try and deliver that collectively differently in a better way with the third sector, um, we'll have examples of how we've, we, we've done that, including primary care money going to third sector. You know, all of us have got examples of that in order to assist GPs. Um, but I think um, the the kind of um, real uh, op possibility with the existing budgets is that we have um, some real workforce challenges. And actually, one of the conversations that's a really helpful lever in terms of shifting existing ways of working is the the you know as people tr sort of try and push forward with what they've traditionally done and what they keep doing doesn't brings the same result in that they can't recruit to the existing model or it, it gives a real platform for you know that kind of if you always do what you've always done you'll get what you've got um, I, again another opportunity to bring people together and say come on there, there are a range of different ways in which we could think about this let's really be a little bit bold and, and go out there so there are ways to facilitate those uh, discussions with staff with staff side with unions in order to, to, to think differently but it is something you're having to almost co Coach people along in and, and help them feel safe and secure because people go into the professions they go in because that's the profession they want to do and it's scary when they think they're going to be asked to do something different. Thank you very much. Br briefly, Sandra. Yeah, I mean, you're all excited about the new monies that you mentioned. I just throw something into the mix. Do you think the board should get direct funding on their own? Would that help? If not, what would help apart from just the new monies? Very briefly, um, <laughs> Judith. Um, I, I'm always hesitant on, on that one, albeit that I, I jumped in to answer the question, because um, and we talk about this a, a lot. We're very, very active as a group of chief officers nationally in Health and Social Care Scotland. Um, there is something which is very, very challenging about the way the budget comes to us, undoubtedly. Um, but there is something that I think we, 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 we need to um, analyse more, perhaps, which is the creative tension that exists in, in the sorts of conversations that we get into because all partners are absolutely have to be signed up to this and I think a lot of that Eddie's touched on the sort of um, conversation that you can have with a local authority about the significant contribution of housing and housing models in that community planning arena is is, is hugely important um, and I, I don't know, I genuinely don't know if we would get the same traction um, and discussion about those, those different ways of working if we weren't all involved in the kind of challenging conversations, but the ones that, you know, when the tension's right, they can be creative tensions rather than ones that detract us from the, the, the ultimate goal. Robert McCulloch, Graham. Um, where we have new monies, um, you're able to pump prime, so you're not stopping something to start something else, so it's always easier with new money. Um, you do get a, an increased level of debate from all of the parties, because there's a greater degree of freedom as to what you can actually use that funding for. Uh, I think all of the parties are conflicted 
in deciding on the budget and its allocations from councils, allocation from NHS, and then there's a, a smattering of uh, free money, if you like, in between that. Uh, so there is a concern from NHS and from uh, council bodies around the value that they get on the back of the money that's gone in. Now, there's bound to be a good thing in that, but it is a difficult negotiation that has to take place at the IGB as to how you're actually going to make that spend. There are a number of masters over this funding, and trying to keep everybody on the same page is quite a difficult, challenging, enjoyable job for us all to do here. Um, I think there is more that we could do to simplify the money in the way that the budgets are actually uh, delegated to the IGBs. I think there is more work that we could do with that. Thank you very much. Emma Hopper. Good morning, everybody. It is interesting to hear about labelling new money or not labelling it. And for me, I love what you said, Jan, is about ditching the lanyards between NHS and Council. And I'm interested in focusing on set-aside money, because I find it all really complicated and where the set-aside money is supposed to be the integrated joint board's share of the budgets for delegated acute services provided by large hospitals on behalf of the IJB. But it seems that there are different approaches to set aside budgets and some health boards delegate the hospital budgets as payments to the IJB, which have no separately identified set aside budget. So it's very complicated. So I think it would be good to hear some kind of simplified response about set aside budget. How could it work better? Are there problems with it? And the fact that um, it's in our submission, it says that North Lanarkshire, you've transferred the community asset assessment and rehabilitation service from acute sector to the localities as an example of a shift in the resources. So, so basically, you're using some of this set-aside money for uh, social care. So it would be really great to hear some kind of simple approach to set-aside. So if I try and say a, a simple approach to, to set aside, um, when IGBs were established, you know, there were 10 different specialities or unscheduled care that it was deemed that different type of work in the community could actually change, you know, the volume going through uh, the hospital. And actually then they looked and said, so what does that cost going through the hospital? And for us in, in East Ayrshire, it's approximately £20 million. And so it should be that if we're operating effectively in the community, we can actually reduce, and these specialities, you know, diabetes might be one, you know, and actually reduce what's happening in the hospital and therefore shift the, you know, the support to that in the, the community. The alternative being that if we don't achieve that, we will see that going up. I think as we discussed earlier, we're doing good work, but it's still floating about the same, you know, position. In terms of how it's come to be reported, you know, I think in many areas, it's just a statistic, you know, that like actually what people do is that they look at the end of the financial year and they say, so in the 10 specialities, how much, you know, how many beds converted into money did East Ayrshire use, and then they give me a figure. So actually, in the first few years of us operating, it's not, it, it's been a, a reporting position rather than actually a leverage position, you know. So I, I do think we are at the stage of, say, we three years in, we're moving into our second strategic plan. We have set, you know, like targets, trajectories against the ministerial strategic group indicators to actually bring down spend in these areas. And when we bring spend down spend in these areas, that's where you should see release off of, you know, the, the, the set aside budget. If you're sitting here and, you know, we're all chief officers of IGIBs rather than acute directors, the acute director would say to you, well, actually see if I see whole wards closing, because we just been shutting one bed doesn't actually save anything. You need to be at the scale of shutting a whole ward. They will get into a conversation then about, that's okay, we'll move that across. But it has to be done in a scale that not only, you know, it meets demand and then goes past meeting demand to actually reduce, reduce that. So I, I, I think set aside just now is a good indicator of usage against unscheduled care, but we're not reaching a stage where it's actually, and it's, it's like the previous front, uh, question, we're actually seeing it fall below where it would release that across to us. Judith um, Proctor. The, the, the set-aside always does feel like an, a, an exam question. It is, it is highly complex, and I often come back to um, what can be helpful in, in my thinking around it is the intent 
around why that was in the legislation. Why do we have responsibility sitting with the integration joint boards to plan uh, those services? And I think that is largely about how we create a community-focused service in, in order to support people better in, in communities as, as far as we can um, and to support the management across our, our, our um, service which is under pressure in a far more managed way so to address some of the issues around unscheduled care and so on. And I think part of the challenge around it is that we, we, we do quite naturally focus on the, the funding and the set aside um, but I think it's the activity of doing the strategic planning uh, that maybe some of us as IGBs with our with our NHS acute partners have been slow to, to get started and I, and I think uh, thinking about my own experience around this that's largely because of the intense focus early, early doors and developing our IGBs and our strategic plan, the intense focus was on the transformation within uh, and the creation of the health and social care partnerships. Uh, so I think increasingly, and again working um, as, as groups of uh, um, IGBs and health and social care partnerships where there is more than one working with a board, the opportunity, is, the opportunity there is to think about doing that planning at a population level. So for us in Lothian, you know, what did a population level would make a difference in terms of how we plan um, A&E services that support support more people to, to come home rather than be admitted into uh, into the hospital? How would we deliver respiratory services in a way that was far more focused on preventing acute uh, exacerbations of respiratory illness? And what could we do from a community perspective that actually help people who have respiratory illness to be as well as possible for uh, as long as possible and deliver as little of that care in a hospital as is required? So it's the highly specialist stuff that we, we're, we're, we're still to do. So I think thinking about that intent and seeing it as our planning responsibility is, is really important. And I, but I, I, I do think part of the challenge around that is the, 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 the capacity that we had at the time to do that bit of strategic planning, because it is very different from what we've done before. Pam Goggins. Yeah, I think to date, and, and Judith has described the kind, again, the process that we should be taking forward from a strategic perspective and are starting to get into. But that budget at the moment is generally referred to as a notional budget. Yeah, so it's got a budget with potential, but it's not an act, well, certainly not in any size an actual budget that we are able to take and invest to, to, to make change. So there's the potential if we can achieve the reductions in unscheduled care to, to a particular level that we would then technically have that to invest um, and support our developments in the community. But at the moment, the word to date for us, it's been described as a notional uh, budget. So it's on our account, it's on our ledger, but it comes in and and, and doesn't it doesn't go anywhere. Sure. Just to, if I may refer you, to North Lanarkshire submission on on paragraphs uh, uh, three point two and three point three of page four, because uh, I certainly would encourage committee. Um, a very last sentence on three three, it says at a national level there's a delay in accessing the current uh, activity levels with the current prices, and that might give you uh, some understanding. In paragraph three two, we set out. Um, uh, the, the change in uh, hospital capacity, the resource consequentials will be determined through that process. But if we, if you can look at the data in terms of that activity shift, then you would see what notionally could be moved. And I think it's uh, going back to Eddie's point just about scale. So prevention of acute admission for respiratory illness, right, COPD, and I know about this because I'm the cross-party group lung health convener, if we keep folk out of hospital by pulmonary rehab investment, that will be a way to maybe use some of that um, money that's notional or for emergencies or unscheduled admissions, which is uh, set aside. And if we put our, I guess, our money into pulmonary rehab, that will ultimately prevent acute admissions. And I, I think Pam said earlier that some of the shift we're seeing just now is some of the specialist resources. So these specialist respiratory nurses, so some of these specialist cardiac nurses, etc. they are out working with us in the community. They have come across, you know, and work with us. And that's the type of support. And actually reducing that is really important. I don't think any of us have really mentioned, you know, palliative and end-of-life care. But a high proportion of this is actually people getting in and out of hospital in the last six months of life. And if we can actually provide better services around palliative and end-of-life care, we will see a significant improvement, first of all, in the quality of life for people, and secondly, see that reduced demand in the, the hospital. So we, we talk about this a bit as if it's, it's notional, etc. It's really close to all our hearts. Actually, if we get this right, 
we will see that shift. We'll all be able to evidence with the number whether the overall demands in communities are going up. But some of the ministerial strategic group indicators that are at the very end of the list about where people spend the last six months of their life, they're really important, not just in terms of quality, but also in terms of the cost that's associated around that. Thank you very much. David Thanks. Stewart. Uh, uh, thank you, Convener. Can I move on to the area of mental health spending? You'll know that across the parliamentary divide, there's lots of interest in this particular area. And I suppose on an almost simplistic uh, view, there's a sense that mental health has been a bit of the poor relation compared to physical health. Um, could you perhaps give um, descriptions of how you spent additional funding on mental health services in your own particular areas? I'm, uh, I'm happy to, uh, to share a, uh, an example of existing funding uh, merged with some new funding in order to support wellbeing. Uh, in Murray, we, all, we had uh, produced a strategy two years ago that was mel men good we mental health for all in, in Murray with a very strong wellbeing focus. And as a result of that, we had, and this again was a very tricky uh, um, path to follow. We had we decommissioned a service that had been in existence for 30 years and with a small number of clients that were receiving a really good service, but it, in terms of us looking forward and where we were looking to try and make some shifts and modernise, there, there was an opportunity to look, to work with these individuals to, to the right resolution for them longer term, but release that money to recommission something that was going to be fit for, for going forward. We also had, like others, modernising primary care funds and had done some tests around link workers and uh, creating um, environments where people could be diverted away from medical interventions, not you know not as a, you know, you can't have a medical intervention, but to more community-based and connect you know, making connections and having good mental health. And so we commissioned a, a third sector provider um, to provide uh, good self-management, good anxiety management, good interventions around uh, depression, both uh, and uh, those kind of uh, broader uh, issues that people experience, um, both in group settings and in individual settings with the link workers as part of that model um, in a hub and spoke uh, outreach model into to uh, primary care across Murray. Um, and that is coming to uh, a point where we'll be getting a, a, a bit of an evaluation in on how that's gone. I know they've seen lots of people and have uh, have some good success stories and that that has been well received generally uh, across the area. Um, interestingly, but per perhaps even more impressive is alongside that we have had some community activists who have, have worked really, really hard to create a hub, a wellbeing uh, hub um, and develop champions and peer support um, and, and these uh, different sort of paid services versus volunteers have been working very close together and, and that has been extremely uh, successful in, in how that's changed people's lives and also added to others. So I think we've done quite well. Our submission. Uh, there's reference made to the um, reprovision of, of beds from the Royal Edinburgh Hospital into community settings, um, and and I think that's that's definitely to be welcomed in terms of people who've experienced inpatient care and who we can support in more uh, intense, albeit more more private accommodation uh, in the community. Uh, we did um, agree the uh, the integration joint board has agreed a, a number of outlined strategic commissioning plans, two of which um, will focus one will focus on mental health provision in the longer term and another on learning disability and that will look at a blend of the kinds of provisions in community for it for individuals who have those needs but I think increasingly as well we need to think about the promotion of good mental health and well-being and how we support particularly um, primary care practitioners our, our GPs and our primary care practices in relation to first-line support and the creation of good mental well-being um, and the the work that um, we're beginning to outline around the link worker program I think in support of that and in support of primary care being uh, an area that's able to support people appropriately who, who, who first attend. So I think it's the entire spectrum, of course, across 
um, mental health that we need to look at, primary prevention, good mental well-being, the support of people who've maybe got low-level uh, mental health problems, and all the way through to those people who've got long-term and enduring mental health problems. Learning disability, obviously, we want to be looking for, for those of us in partnerships that don't have children's services, and how we invest in good transitions and support young people into the, 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 the kind of life that they would be looking for, increasingly using self-directed support as a, as a means for, for, for doing that. So, I mean, I just think it's a, such an important area, you know, and with, with some of the, the resources that we've had already, we've worked very closely with, with localities around GP practices, and they've told us, like, counselling for young people, etc., been the, the, the important thing for this, so we've been able to invest there. Other areas, it's been the, the community uh, connector uh, model. Again, in Ayrshire and Arran, we've had the benefit of recently having the new hospital, you know, Woodland View, you know, moving over from the, the, the Ilza campus, and that has been fantastic. I was doing a leadership walk round of the rehabilitation wards and the opportunities for people to, to be rehabilitated in a more homely environment and step back across into, and I know I'm stuck in this, into good housing options, actually going back into the community and actually transitioning there is really important. I think we look forward to the investment in primary care. You know, again, you know, we have Comarnock Prison, you know, on our patch and actually support in the prison, uh, support at the emergency department, you know, these investments, and I think support right in the GP, you know, like practice. You know, I was speaking to, to one of our practices recently and they have a thousand people on antidepressants. And they look forward to when they've got attached mental health worker and pharmacist. It's, you know, about actually how do we do reviews of these? How do they not just become repeat prescriptions? How do we make sure we actually change people's lives? And that's the type of investment in primary care, you know, that I think can actually start to really make a, a difference uh, around us. So the investment that is proposed to come to us there is really important. And it's how we make sure that works alongside our existing teams. So our existing mental health teams tend to be dealing with very much, I would say, a more acute end rather than a preventative end. So just now, I think some of the investment has to come in and support us at that lower level preventative things, what we would normally call primary mental health rather than acute mental health. You know, at that end, I think is where we're seeing the benefits just now. And that's Janice here. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, in North Lanarkshire, what we've decided to do is uh, a truly integrated teams on three things, <coughs> uh, children and families, mental health, learning disability, justice and addictions, and long-term conditions and frailty. So that, that's three themes. So we're forgetting the, the labels on uh, any of the practitioners, where you work, wh who you work for, and those teams will truly come together. So we've talked about the connections with justice services, and it was the the staff who decided uh, those groupings would be most effective. Now, if you take those uh, uh, Venn diagram circles, they interface with each other. So children and families uh, sometimes have uh, families with addiction problems, mental health problems. If you take older people and that, uh, with dementia and that uh, connect with mental health services. So those three teams will absolutely not work in isolation. They will work together as three teams, sharing uh, all the knowledge and experience and, and also uh, the data around uh, some of those families because it's really important to do so. But on the spectrum of mental health from forensic, um, uh, we've had quite a programme of out of area placements back into locality. Uh, the inpatient programme and, and making that service better, the um, out of area and the community placements have been a, a huge focus for us um, and the community supports around that. If I was to leave one legacy in integration uh, uh, as I left the building, it would be in our children's wellbeing and uh, mental health. So please, please, please invest in our children's wellbeing. Um, the referrals uh, that we've had in CAM services have risen in tier three and severe by 23%. There's something not right. There's something we're not doing right with families or children. So. Um, I, I'm not quite sure we're using the evidence to know what works um, around children, but part of the challenge is the workforce challenge around that. And um, I've said previously um, around the investment in the right practitioners, that's not, um, that's a, a range of practitioners. Um, we need to make sure that's a proper investment. So in mental health, uh, from uh, children's wellbeing through to forensic, uh, let, let's get this right. I'm going to call it
I don't want to take anything away from what Janice just said, actually, because I, think, I don't think there's anything more important than the statement she just said. The demand on our uh, children at the moment is, is increasing at a, a terrifying rate. Uh, and in particularly around transition, I think for all of us, between children's services and adult services is a real problem that we have to face up to now. Uh, and it is something that we should, uh, we need to grapple with and actually get a solution to it. There is something happening there that is not right and we need to put a fix to it. Just one last thing on uh, primary care. Uh, we need to make sure that we have a different approach to mental health that is everybody's business. There are a number of practitioners um, who should be involved in mental health that are perhaps not involved as much as they should be. Um, I had one practice in a previous uh, post, post of a GP where 50% of his consultations were about mental health and all he was able to do was refer on. Now that's the most expensive piece of triage that I've ever seen. So we need to make sure that when we're developing uh, primary care clusters and community work, we actually get those link workers that we refer to that can actually deal with some of these lower issues within mental health that often lead into others. But I just don't want to take away anything that Janice said. This is something that I would encourage this committee and others to actually have a real focus on around children at the moment in mental health. I think the answers have been very helpful, Convener. Can I just ask a, a follow-on? I think, Janice, you covered a bit of what I was going to say. Is how you measure the effectiveness, particularly if you've got additional resources, is it genuinely all additional, or is there some substitution? In other words, is there any element of stealing from Peter to pay Paul and, and additional funding that comes to you on mental health services? Thanks, please. So, I mean, it depends on the, the approach from the, you know, the partner bodies in terms of how you're funded. So if somebody comes and said, you know, you're getting 2% cash release efficiency savings, IGIBs on the whole don't have the back office functions. So we don't manage, you know, property. We don't manage, you know, the HR department. We don't manage the finance department. So if somebody asked me for 2% cash release efficiency savings, it's only out of frontline services that I have. I don't have other services. So what we always try and do, as we said before, is be innovative and manage demand, etc. We haven't been at the stage where we've taken the new money and actually had it away somewhere and done that. We've actually up front done things with local communities to try and reduce demand and cost in the other services so as we can make there. So we use the new money as a driver to save over there, you know, at some of the traditional savings that we've had today. So so we try and be transparent at everything we do in terms of, of doing that. We don't try and, you know, cost substitute in that way. Finally, I'll call Hamilton. Thank you, Convener, and good morning. morning to the panel. Thank you for coming to see us today. Before I ask my question, I just want to associate myself with the remarks of Janice Stewart and indeed Robin McCullough Graham in respect of um, child and adolescent mental health. I think that aligns with what we're hearing from stakeholders, what we're hearing in our constituency surgeries, and is now fast becoming the imperative under which this whole parliament must move um, at, at the on pain of you know anguish suffered by some of Scotland's most vulnerable children. I want to ask you a similar question to what I asked in the session last year, this time last year. I asked specifically about uh, funding for drug and alcohol services. We learned this morning that uh, treatment times are outstripping by a country mile what we had anticipated or thought they were, particularly as people are being seen for consultations, but they're not receiving uh, the sort of prescription support that they need for several months after that. We know that um, over the last two to three years, we've had a, a dip in funding towards ADPs of some 23%, and that was then measured out in the highest uh, drug-related deaths in the whole of Europe um, last summer. So whilst there has been an increase of £20 million, it strikes me that that doesn't close the gap that we've encountered. It doesn't restart services that were lost to us or, or, or re, um, bring back that lost organisational memory. So can I ask the panel, how much more do we need to spend in this area uh, before we're back to where we were? And what do we need, to, uh, what does success look like in terms of a fully funded drug and alcohol service model? Who would like to start? Janice? There has been a reduction in ADP services, and um, I'm reluctant to say give it just for ADP, having said take the labels off things. Um, and, and we've had this conflict uh, locally about accounting. So the ADP funding's mainstreamed for me. So the labels off it, which was a huge help 
uh, believe it or not. Now, conversely, you're then talking about the, the performance that you've then associated with that cut and the performance target that's gone up somewhere else. For me, the association between uh, children and family services and then learning disability, mental health, addictions and justice, because some of those individuals are, are the same and some of them are fathers and grandfathers and kinship care, you know, all of those of our children. Um, so um, for me, I don't mind that the label's gone and, and I just want to use it in a different way. Where we see trends or differences in performance, we need to react to that. Um, but certainly from, from my perspective, I'm putting a, a set of different services around and, and using the money in a kind of slightly different way. Now, if, if the consequences of that for North Lanarkshire are the, is that the, the drug-related deaths, I need to review what, what's happened there. But, but certainly since the labels come off it, and I know you still want me to report on that, which is, which is interesting because I've taken the label back off and, and, and we're still asked to report on it. So I have a wee bit of a conflict around that. Fraser. In East Ayrshire, we have not seen a reduction in our, our funding to the, the ADP, and for us it is funding to the ADP rather than the funding for overall addiction services, which are two different things. So our ADP has an independent chair, and the 1.6 million goes to them, and they then have a discussion, of, of basically on a community planning basis, about where the right place to, to invest is. They've done some really innovative investment. They've uh, invested with Bernardo's, and Bernardo's have been able to bring the exact same money to the table, so we've doubled their money, you know, in effect. You know, we invest with Scottish Drugs Forum, who have actually done some work around getting people into work. Uh, we've done some work with Ad, Ad, Ad Action who help people in, in recovery. So, so that funding is slightly different from Janice's. So we give it to our body that we call, you know, the ADP. And last year, even although there was a reduction in funding, you know, Ayrshire and Aaron covered that reduction and, and then come in and maintained our, our level of funding. And we've continued to work with the partners to do things uh, uh, differently. Going forward, you know, like, this, is, this is about treatment and the numbers of people that we get through treatment and to recovery is still too small. You know, the numbers of people who are long-term on, you know, like substitute prescribing is still too many. And actually, you know, again, just, just last week, I was with East Ayrshire Churches and Homelessness, you know, like group, and the local churches are working with a whole range of people who have complex issues that go from alcohol and drug addiction right through into to homelessness. So some of this is about, you know, like, we can do the treatment stuff and we can invest in treatment, but actually if we're going to see a difference in this, we need to go back and be looking at why some of the individuals are harmed and actually they are you know, like, you know, self-medicating in that type of way to actually take themselves away from society. And there's a whole range of different reasons there you know, for people. So for us, it is about investing, and I think the role of the ADP is, is a positive role in terms of thinking more widely than just about treatment services, is about thinking right into prevention. And they do invest in, you know, like an alcohol coordinator for our schools. You know, like, so the types of things that they've been able to invest in uh, is, is really positive. Yeah, I would echo everything that, that Eddie said there. That the approach here is absolutely about a whole partnership and community approach, and that's no different to how it's, it's needed to be um, for, for years now. Um, and I think in terms of our position, we're very you know similar to, to what Eddie's described um, in Murray and actually accessing services, and that is really... Uh, we've got a good integrated service operating with the third sector um, in Murray. Um, but it, it's, it's interesting um, from my perspective, my, ba my background is mental health nursing and was an addictions nurse and um, I managed uh, addiction services uh, years ago in a context where drug related deaths were a, a, a real issue and uh, understanding what, what in, in the area that I worked in, understanding what was contributing to that was was really important before we jumped in with as to what the so solutions are. So I think we really need to understand that from a care and treatment perspective. But by far, the we're back to Janice's statement: the greatest um, investment we can have is not is where we start with children and how we prevent them getting into that position um, in the first place. I think in my experience in working with people, it is it is a. Uh, 
uh, a very challenging task. People don't choose generally to be in the position they're in. They're generally not very happy in the position they're in, but their confidence and their ability to change is usually pretty depleted. Um, and so, you know, methadone, substitute prescribing, the, these things are, are a tool. And the, the more dominant they are, the less effective you're going to be in getting into a, a, a recovery model. They have to be seen as a tool, but actually that recovery model and that supporting individuals is a big, big task to help them remove themselves from their their day-to-day -day, uh, environment and actually confidence is probably the biggest inhibitor I, I would say but we really need to understand what we're responding to before we actually are sure that it's a money issue I had lots of money when I was managing that there wasn't the same strict stringent issues with money that there is now money was not the solution it was culture it was understanding it was resilience to work in, in very challenging conditions and, and hope that these individuals could, could achieve. No, I, I get that. I absolutely mm. do. Um, but take, for example, Edinburgh, and I'd like to hear from Judith Proctor, if, if I may, after this. But last year, that um, cut, that 23% cut to ADP funding across the board was um, re manifest in a £1.3 million reduction in our nation's capital, which has to have some kind of impact. You're not, if you're, if you're not paying workers anymore, they're disappearing to other jobs. So the, the, the fo footprint of provision is reduced, and that must have a tangible effect. But uh, I accept what you say about culture. I'm afraid I wouldn't be able to give you a very full answer on that one, just just given my, my my relative newness in post. But more than happy to have a conversation in in, in that as we begin to understand it. Um, one thing I, I have uh, been made aware of is the the elevation of the the work of the ADP within the IGB, and I think that can only be a good thing that it's been seen in the context of that partnership. But I'm afraid I, I can't give you the detail that would be be useful okay. today. Okay, thank you very much, colleagues. I know there are other questions colleagues would wish to ask, but we have already had a very full session, and can I thank the witnesses for uh, their evidence this morning. We will now uh, take a five-minute break and move into private session when we resume.